Hey everybody, this is Hadrian. Thank you for watching. Let's get started with our Civilization 5 tutorial. I want to reiterate at the outset that this is not going to be just a tutorial though. It's very much going to be a let's play. Those of you who have been on my channel for a while who want to see the beginning of a campaign all the way to the end of the campaign, that's what's going to happen here. I promise you. I just want to spend some time up front for people who might be new to Civ 5 or who might be looking to get into Civ 6 and wanting to break into the series. I want to just provide some explanation for some of the basic mechanics. On that note, I also will not be going into tremendous detail. I'm going to do my best to treat the things that are intuitive about Civ 5 as intuitive. I'm not going to explain how to move a unit that much because that's something that I trust people can figure out. So of course, if there's a very simple mechanic that I don't explain that you would like me to explain, feel free to leave a comment and I'm happy to talk to you about it or maybe mention it in a future episode. But for now, I just want to spend about 60 seconds talking about the setup here, maybe a little bit longer than 60 seconds, because this is worthy of discussion. When you are new to Civ 5, you've got this massive list of civilizations to choose from. How the heck do you pick one? I have two pieces of advice for you. We're going to play as Rome in this series and both pieces of advice apply. First of all, I like Rome. I have this problem. <laughs> I'm a huge Romanophile. People who've been following my channel for a while know that I like to play as Rome in a lot of my series. I won't always play as Rome, I promise, but for now we're going to play as Rome. Number one, because I like it, so that's first piece of advice. Pick a civilization that you enjoy and you feel connected to. Second piece of advice is the other reason we're picking Rome. Look for a bonus that you can somewhat understand as a new player. And I'm doing this for you guys here. That's the other reason I'm picking Rome. Extra 25% production towards any buildings that already exist in the capital. That is Rome's bonus as a civilization. That's pretty easy to understand. Any building that you've already built in the capital will build 25% faster anywhere else. It's pretty straightforward. If you look at, say, the Songhai, receive triple gold from barbarian encampments and pillaging cities. Land units gain the war canoe and amphibious promotions, strengthening them while embarked. What the heck does that mean if you've never played Civ before? Of course, as you play the game more, you will understand more of these things and you'll be able to branch out and play more civilizations. And, you know, you can, of course, see that they all have unique units and unique buildings here. But it's good. It's not necessary, but it's good to start with a civilization whose bonus you kind of understand. So we're going to play as Rome. Note that we have access to the Ballista and the Legion. These are classical era military units. And we've got this cool little logo that certainly resembles no other logo I've ever seen before in my life. <laughs> um, we're going to play on an Earth map type. It's going to be a caricature, kind of a cartoony caricature of Earth. It's not going to be like an exact map like you, like you would see in one of my Total War series or anything like that. Um, but it will span the entire planet, so that's kind of kind of different. It's not limited to just Europe, like some of the series I've played in the past, so that'll be fun. Standard map size. Difficulty level. I just want to say very quickly, if you're new to the game, I'd recommend playing on either Chieftain or Warlord. If you are new to games, period, and you're getting into Civ because you heard it's approachable and awesome and you want to play it, I would say either Settler or Chieftain. If you are a strategy game player, if you have played chess or stratego or board games before chieftain's probably the way to go it's very straightforward it's for beginners settler is extremely handholdy and i think for people who already have a mind for strategy it tends to get on your nerves after just a few turns because it's it just does everything for you pretty much so we're gonna play on prince i tend to play on either prince or king difficulty of course the difficulties go all the way up to deity we might play on a higher difficulty level if I do another series on Civ 5 in the future, but for now, we're going to go with just the normal difficulty so you can get a snapshot of what the game is like at the default level. Game pace. This is another reason I wanted to go through the settings with you real quick. It might be the biggest reason, frankly, because this is a common misunderstanding. I definitely misunderstood it when I started Civ. When you are getting into this game, you might be tempted to think, oh, okay, this is a game about going through the eras of history and you know, telling a story of a civilization from beginning to end. So if I pick Marathon, I'll have more time in the in the ancient age to do, to build more units and wage more wars and tell a richer story in each age. No, doesn't work that way. The game pace literally sets only the length of the game, how long everything takes. Everything will be faster in quick mode. The game will go by faster, buildings will build faster, units will build faster, technologies will finish quicker in quick. Marathon, everything is slower. 
relative to the length of the game, everything kind of stays the same. So units will take much longer to build in Marathon. The only thing that really stays the same and doesn't uh, get scaled based on the game pace is how far units can move. So if you pick Marathon, units will be able to move farther in a shorter chunk of history, if you will, than they would in Quick because less time is going by per turn. Fewer years are going by per turn when you're playing on Marathon. So units are able to get farther earlier in history as you move them around the map and maybe explore. That's really the only difference that I can think of. If you can think of any others, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Last but not least, we're gonna talk about the advanced setup here. We're gonna cut it down to six civilizations just to give us a little bit of breathing room since this is a tutorial. We're gonna play with 12 city-states, victory types, pretty self-explanatory. Time is the most board gamey of the victory types. It's the victory type that says, by a certain point, the player with the highest score will win. Science is whoever does the most research. Domination is whoever does the most conquering. Cultural is whoever has the most influence other, uh, of, over other civilizations. And diplomatic is the city that has the, or I'm sorry, the civilization that has the most control over the policy of the globe, which is kind of a cool thing that happened toward, happens towards the end of civilization campaigns. Last but not least, I know I've already said that once, but the very last thing I want to point out, if you're a new player, you have the option, you have a whole bunch of options really, but you have the option of turning on no barbarians. You can turn off barbarians completely. And as a new player, when you're learning to establish your empire and sending units out into the unknown, that can be handy. So consider that if you're new and you want to dial the difficulty back a bit while you're learning the game. We're going to leave it on because it makes things interesting. So let's start the game and there'll be a bit of narration to start us off here. Blessings of the gods be upon you, Caesar Augustus, Emperor of Rome, and all her holdings. Your empire was the greatest and longest lived of all in Western civilization, and your people single handedly have shaped its culture, law, art, and warfare like none other before or since. Yeah, they have. Okay, so we're going to start off here. This is what you will see every single time you start a game of civilization. You have a very small snapshot of the world and a very small snapshot of the mini-map. This map will, of course, grow in all four directions, all four corners, as I like to say, as you uncover more of the world. You have a settler and a warrior. It is 4000 BC, and let's go ahead, as I like to do, go up here to the info panel and pull up research info. As you can see, we have just finished agriculture. We've learned how to farm, and our civilization can now begin. So, the very first thing I want to say, when you're starting a game of civilization, you say, hey, I don't have a city yet. That's what this settler is for. Maybe I'm tempted to move the settler to another tile and have a city in a slightly different location. You can do that if you really want to. Just know that the game very generally and almost always puts you in a very advantageous start position relative to the other squares around you. If you're a skilled player, you have some experience and you want to move your city by a tile or two before you settle it, you can do that. Just understand that as a new player, every turn that you take without a city that's building things is a turn that you are behind. So you're going to have to play catch up. It is possible. It's very possible to play catch up. But just know that you are handicapping yourself or the op you're, you're handicapping the other civilizations because you're make making it easier for them from the outset. So we're going to go ahead and found our city. Here's Rome. I have no idea where we are in the world right now, but we'll find out at some point. And now, as you can see here, this button has changed to choose production. Let me just say very quickly, this button here will change depending on what you need to do. One of the very best things about Civilization V, and as a new player, this will be a great comfort to you. The game... <laughs> that, that pig decided to say hello right during my pause. <laughs> the game never lets you forget anything. Civ V is very good about cycling through all of your buildings and all of your, all of your units every single turn just in case there is something that you need to do. It is possible, of course, to tell a city or a unit to just chill out and not request orders. But the default is for the game to go through every single unit you have and say, hey, what do you want me to do this turn? And this button will be the way that you do it. So let's just trust the button and go f with what it tells us to do. This is our main city of Rome. We have the option to choose production. So we can start building something in Rome. We can build a worker, a scout, a warrior, or a monument can't quite build a settler yet because Rome only has one citizen and we require two citizens. As you can see, in eight turns, it will grow to size two to have two citizens. Is that literally the number of citizens in the empire? No. Pull up demographics and you'll see we have a thousand population. But 
That's just the way the game kind of interprets it simply. So we have one citizen. I'll explain more about citizens momentarily in either this episode or the next. So let's pause before we pick production, and I want to talk about some very important mechanics for each city now that we're looking at our first city in Civilization V. Rome is currently producing two food, five production, four science, three gold, one culture, and zero faith. What does that mean? <laughs> well, let's take a look at production, for instance. We're producing five production, and you can point to it and see what it's coming from. Two from terrain, and three from buildings. So, when it comes to buildings, what that means is we have a building in Rome. We have this palace, since it's our capital. As you can see, that palace is giving us three production. And then, notice when I clicked Rome, I can now see the terrain modifiers around Rome, including the one where Rome is sitting. And that has two production and two food. We'll talk more about what those mean in just a second. So that adds up to our five production. Now, what does that mean for everything that we need to make? Well, sorry, clicking the wrong stuff here. Notice that the scout costs 25 production total. Well, it's going to take five turns to build because we're putting out five production per turn. So if you want Rome to build faster, find ways to have more production per turn. If you want your technologies, your civilization to research faster, find ways to get Rome to produce more science. If you want to make more money, gold. If you want to have more culture so that you can have more social policies and a more robust, deeper, more intricate civilization, find ways to produce more culture. It's all about how you want to play the game. It's all about your strategy. As I mentioned in the introductory video, there are so many different ways to win Civ 5. I'm going to do a little bit of everything, so you should have an advantage regardless of the way you want to play in watching this series because it'll show you many, many different ways to approach winning the game. So what we're going to start with, one more thing I'll point out. Notice that my economic advisor is making a recommendation here. There are different icons. The science advisor is a little blue triangle. The cultural advisor is a purple jewel. The military advisor is a red shield. If you want to pursue a certain strategy and you're not too familiar with the game yet, you can follow the recommendations of your advisors. If you want to be a science heavy player, you could follow the recommendations of the blue triangle whenever you see it and just do what it tells you to. And it will kind of walk you towards things that will generally be in that area. Of course, you should make your own decisions once you understand how to play the game because you are kind of guiding it. But just know that that's there to help you. We're going to ignore the economic advisor. You'll find out why soon. We're going to go with a scout first. I like to have scouts for reasons that you can already see on the screen. Notice, and the game's already told us, we've, we've discovered two ancient ruins. There's one here and one here. Ruins are the game's way of rewarding players for exploring the map. And scouts are a great way not only to find as many ruins as possible early on, but also just to explore the map. And so you know what other civilizations might be near you, what other city-states might be near you, and just what the terrain around you looks like. Maybe where you want your next city to be after you have built your, your second settler. So now the button, as you can see, has changed to choose research. So let's move on. Let's look at our research options. Everything is going to take 10 turns. So know that, So knowing that we are producing four science in Rome, can you guess how much each of these policies cost in research? Or science, rather? 40, exactly. So, and notice we also have some recommendations here. Military recommendation, economic recommendation, and foreign recommendation. This is the cultural uh, advisor. So, I'm going to go with pottery for one reason alone. Well, actually, a couple of reasons. These buildings are handy to have as early as possible. The granary and the shrine. I'll explain more about what those do when we're looking at building them. But researching pottery gives us options to re to open up this tree. So as soon as we research pottery, we'll be able to research sailing, calendar, or writing. And I want to research writing as soon as possible because it will allow us to build the first wonder. And also that wonder, as you can see as, that I'm pointing to, it will give us a free technology which is very, very handy when you want to get a leg up early on. So that's what I'm gunning for. We're going to go with pottery to start. So now a unit needs orders. As I was saying, it's helping us see what we need to do each turn, it's helping, helping kind of guide us through. So quick note about the map, since we're going to move for the first time here. I have the grid turned on. You can hit the G key to toggle that on and off. I like to have it turned on because it makes it, it brings out the board game aspects of Civ 5 a little bit 
more obviously and it helps you see how far you have to move it just makes it a bit clearer the plain civilization interface looks like this this is what Civ 5 is going to look like when you boot it up for the first time with nothing no, nothing special turned on but notice if you go down here where I did to map options you can turn on the hex grid I also like to have the resource icons turned on so that I can see the special resources we are just surrounded by truffles so once we have improved these tiles we'll as you can see we'll be able to have some additional happiness for Rome, which is very, very important as Rome starts to get larger. The bigger your populations, the unhappier they are. So things that boost happiness, like special resources, you, you can see some silver up here, are extremely important. And we're just surrounded by truffles. Quick note on that front, you might be saying, oh, okay, well, you can improve all these resources and you got a bunch of happiness. No, you only get the happiness bonus from one improved resource of each type. So I'll get a happiness bonus from truffles and a happiness bonus from silver, but I won't get a bonus from each of these truffles that are surrounding Rome. But as you can see, they will give me some additional gold as well, which would be nice. So I'm going to move my soldier. This is actually a warrior unit, a generic warrior. We don't quite have specialized Roman units yet. Notice that I can move farther in certain directions than I can in others. That's just because of terrain type. If I move into these hills here, I will be able to see farther because I'll be standing on top of a hill. So I won't just be able to see these tiles. I'll be able to see two tiles away. So I'll be able to see more. But in this particular case, I'm going to go here because I want to go to these ruins. And of course, if I were to try to move in these directions, I can move two tiles, not just one, because they're planes. You can point to any tile in the game, and it'll tell you. If you see that tooltip over the a Unit Needs Orders buttons, it'll tell you what type of terrain tile it is. And these are planes, so it's very easy to move two tiles per turn with that. So let's move. And we've discovered the secrets of an ancient technology. That's a good start. But not its mineral rights. <laughs> so there we go. We've discovered mining. That's one of the handy things about doing as much exploring early as uh, early on as possible. So now we will be able to research masonry or bronze working without having to research mining. So we're already 10 turns ahead in just one turn. That's the advantage of exploring, and that's why I like to do a lot of scouting early on. So now notice that the game is now giving us the option. Whoa, this. <laughs> well, since I clicked it, I'll show you. This is their strategic view. This makes it into much more of a classical civilization look where it's it's much more two-dimensional and you can just kind of see what's going on it makes it look purely like a board game if you want it to be but i'm going to keep that turned off what's this hmm. oh cool so there's different overlays i actually haven't seen this before this isn't something i've played with too much but if you are a fan of say the civilization i'm sorry civilization the crusader kings or the europa universalis games from Paradox, you know that map overlays are a big deal. They exist in Total War as well, but overlays are just all over the place, and you can turn those on here. So anyway, we're going to go back to our normal view. Notice that it's now saying next turn. It's 4000 BC at the moment, so some time will pass. This is going to go by very quickly because we haven't encountered anyone yet. And here we go. It is 3960 BC, and notice it jumped us straight to our unit because our unit is the one that needs orders. I'm going to move him back to the ancient ruins. Notice that it's going to take three turns to do it. So we're just going to click through these turns. We're researching pottery. You can see the turn counter counting down. You can see that Rome will have a scout done in soon to be two turns. There we go. And let's see what's in these ruins. 20 culture. Excellent. We'll talk about what that means in just a second, but notice that I'm very near that 25 mark. What that means, well, you can get an idea if you're glancing at the tooltip here, but we'll go into more detail when we actually hit the 25 mark in two turns. One thing I do want to discuss real quick before I have to wrap this episode is what's going on with Rome's growth. Notice that there's all kinds of numbers on this tab here. 15 is the, is the combat strength, basically the defensive rating of the city. This is how long it's going to take to finish building the scout. You can see how far the scout is along by looking at the solid bar here and how far it's going to progress in another turn here. It's just a kind of a visual indicator of how much progress you're making each turn. It's not exact. And then you can see here how many citizens you have. I pointed, the, I pointed to this earlier. And you can also see that it will take five turns to reach the next city. And you don't have to point to the city to see that. I can be looking over here and glance at Rome and see that five and know that in five turns I'm going to have two citizens. So how does Rome grow? Let's take a moment to talk about food because food is what determines 
how fast your cities grow. And we're also going to talk about citizens real quick before I wrap the video, just because it's such a it, the, the, the topics will bleed together. So notice that Rome has, as I mentioned, has one citizen and is producing two food. The two food are coming from this central area of Rome. What I'm going to do here on the city screen is I'm going to go ahead and pull up citizen management. It's minimized by default, so you actually won't see these icons that just popped up. But if you turn it on, you'll see that our one citizen is working the jungle over here. So our one citizen we have in Rome is working one of the tiles around us. We can give the citizen different orders if we want. For instance, by giving the city a production focus order, the citizen moved to these hills. And now we're producing no food, so we're not growing, we're stagnant. But we have seven production, so that scout will finish faster. Still going to take two turns. But notice here... Notice what happens to this bar when I switch back to food focus. See? We have less production per turn, so we're making less progress per turn on the scout. So, this citizen's producing two food. Rome is producing two food by virtue of sitting on a food tile. And, of course, two of the food are being consumed by the citizens we have. So, the grand total, when you point to how much food we're producing, is two. If you want Rome to grow faster, you can keep things on food focus. And as the... Game as the city produces more citizens, they will automatically slot themselves into the tiles that will produce the most food. If you want Rome to build faster, do the same with production. We'll probably switch to production focus pretty soon because that's something that I like to do. But that's what determines the growth rate of your cities. Food is one of the most basic ways that you can grow faster sooner in Civilization V. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and cut the first episode of the tutorial here. In the next episode, we will talk more about culture and policy and what that works and how that works, rather. And also, we're going to keep exploring the map and see maybe where we are in the world and what's going on around us. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'm going to upload new episodes in the tutorial every day at noon, Eastern Standard Time. That's GMT minus five for those of you not in the States. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next episode.